What's up guys, Evil D here, and today I want to speak to you about something that's fascinated me recently. But before I jump into that, I just want to say something. So a lot of time I speak about language evolution and how it affects Esperanto on this channel, and a lot of people get their panties in a twist. They're like, no, language evolution can't happen with Esperanto. If that happens, we'll break up the dialects, and then suddenly we won't understand each other, and then it'll completely like self-explode. And I'm like, whoa, dude. Take a step back here, let's look at some history and how dialects actually form. So there's two main ways dialects form. One, social reasons, two, language isolation, and that's the main one, okay? So you look at the history, for instance, Australian English, British English, and American English. And the reason our Englishes are all slightly different, like we all speak them slightly differently, is one, because we've all been affected by other languages, um, and two, the fact that we've been isolated for a period of like at least 200 years, almost 300 years in some cases, where there was no mass media, there was no um, internet, there was no TV to set a standard standardization for the languages. Now, if you look at it nowadays, because I'm an actor, as an Australian actor, we all have to learn one accent, okay? It's called a standard Australian um, accent, okay? Um, and then the Americans have got standard American you got for your television, unless you're trying to emphasize a dialect. But they all learn one accent and they use that on TV. And we all use one accent, we use it on TV. And I'm sure the Brits do the exact same thing. And the reason being is it helps set a standardization and it helps with understandability. And so that people don't get distracted and go, well, where's he from? And What's happened as a result of that over time is that if, because I'm from Outback Australia, okay, is that what happens is the English starts to standardize. Like we've got um, kind of several dialects in Australia and one you've got like kind of deep outback, you've got down south and then you've got kind of up north. But what's happened is if you go to the cities, you pretty much can't tell where anyone's from because we all speak kind of the same Australian English. Now, even as I grew up, my English has slowly changed. Like when I was growing up, I'd pronounce with the TH more with a with and that was because of the German influence, the heavy German influence in the areas where I was growing up because a lot of them were originally German immigrants and that's how they spoke but now I speak just like everyone else and that's due to mass media like um, television all that type of stuff setting a standardization of how we speak English. Now Obviously that kills off dialects. Over time, dialects are gonna disappear and I've read numerous articles about how dialects are disappearing in some places in America. Obviously I've witnessed it here in Australia as time goes on, dialects slowly disappear. They still exist, but they're becoming more and more mitigated and I assume like in 50 years or so, they just won't exist with a couple more generations. Now that's, that there's isolation. The other one you have is um, social status. So like for instance, uh, you look at uh, the Queen's English. She when she was growing up, I remember watching a documentary on this, her um, English, the way she spoke it was very what you'd call upper class, okay, because she was educated in a very particular way, unlike the rest of society and the people within her level, within the upper class echelons, they all spoke English in a certain way and you could kind of tell who was from what social standing. But as time has gone by and, you know, those the education systems become more standardized and we all kind of are on the same plane, kind of, obviously not all, but we're all more inclined to be on the same plane. What's happened is obviously then the English language that she even speaks has become more standardized as society itself is now um, changing the way she speaks and that I watched this documentary on how her English um, the way she speaks that has slowly changed over time to become more standardized from the very upper class type of um, upbringing she had so it's very interesting to see how one you got social and then two you got isolation and with mass media these slowly start to disappear because we all now hear the same English and slowly we start to speak the same English. So when people say, oh my god, dialects are going to form and it's going to destroy everything with Esperanto, no, it's not going to happen. It will never happen because of, you know, mass media. The only way it's going to happen is if the internet suddenly explodes and we all go back to the dark ages and then most likely Esperanto would disappear because there's no big groupings of us anyway. We're all over the place. But yeah, that's one thing. And another thing is I recently read an article um, that was written by us. Uh, I'm not sure who it was written by, I forgot the name now, but I'll put a link down there if I find it again. Um, it was a study that was done on native Esperanto speakers, um, I think five different families, and the way that natives actually make the language more logical. And when you think about it, 
that's a good thing. And I'll show you what I mean by more logical in a second. But before I jump into that, um, I just wanted to speak about my experiences. I've traveled through Europe and I've gone for a few places. And I've actually met quite a fair few native Esperanto speakers and they generally speak Esperanto exactly like the people around them. There's no difference in the way they speak. And even if they became the majority, something very unlikely, but they, there will definitely be a lot of native Esperanto speakers in the next generation or so. Um, even if they became the majority, they would still speak the language more and more logically as each generation goes along because one, that's at the heart of the language. Sure, natives, they don't really care about that. But two, it's just the way the language has evolved. It's evolving more and more logically. That's just how it is. Now, I want to give you some examples of native speakers. Now, this first word might offend a few of you grumpy old, you know, prudes, but um, there was a native kid and he was, he was in the shower and he was talking with his parents and um, he mentioned... Uh, Peniso, which means penis, okay, and he looked at the mum and he didn't know the word for the female, you know, sexual organ, whatever you want to call it. So what he then said was penisino. He basically just grabbed peniso, which means penis, and he made it female by chucking the in suffix um, onto the word. And when you think about it, that's highly logical if you follow the logic of Esperanto grammar, okay, um, the way the language is built. Now, obviously, if you're one of those people who wants to reform the language or whatever, you know, you're in, you're, you're going down that path, that's probably going to make you a little bit grumpy, but it makes sense according to the rules of Esperanto, and it also is more logical if you follow the rules completely. Now, the, the traditional rules. Now another word, we use the word battery, okay, um, obviously, and the word for battery is batterio. Now what this kid did is he didn't know the word, so he used the next logical choice. He said electruio, which means an electric container. It contains electricity. That is highly logical to me. Like, why didn't we use that word in the first place? It's so much more logical than batterio, which is, unless you know the original meaning of the word, then you know, you have to, well, you have to learn the whole word, obviously, but electruio, and that's, that's completely logical and it saves on learning a new, um, root word. Another one was, uh, a kid said, um, instead of froti la nasoin, which is rub the noses, okay, he said, um, nazi, which means to nose. That makes sense. What else can you do with your nose apart from smell things? And that's flati. So, you know, just rub nose. It makes complete sense. Um, another one said bushy, to kiss. That makes sense as well because there's only so many things you do with your mouth. You speak, paroli, you eat, manji, and to kiss, well, I guess you could say kissy, but if he hasn't learned that word yet, bushy, which is to do mouth. You know, that makes sense. It saves on having to learn another word. Like, I'm not saying that these words are gonna replace the, the words that every other Esperanza is using, but it just, it's logical in the language. Now for us, since we've, we don't come from like a, like an Esperanto thinking background. We all come from our own native languages, and we don't to mouth someone in any language. I don't know. I don't know every language. Maybe you're doing some, but in Esperanto, um, you say kissy. But for a kid who's growing up with all these logical um, rules of how the language works, like he doesn't know the rules, he just instinctively knows them. Okay, it, it makes sense. Another one was langeti, which means to lick or too small tongue. And now that makes sense. If you look at, for instance, ridi and rideti, you know, smile and um, to laugh, ridi is to laugh. That makes sense because he's taking that same type of concept and he's applying it to tongue, langi. It's really quite clever. Another one was malmateno for um, nighttime or malvespero for morning. Makes sense to me. And when you think about it, it's quite clever. It's done like mal is used quite a bit in Esperanto. So you'd think a kid would start natively using it with like freaking everything, the things we wouldn't think about. Another one, a kid was talking to his mum about the fact that uh, when she's no longer pregnant, they'll be able to do all these things together. And he said, mal graveda, which means unpregnant. Well, normally you just say when you're no longer pre pregnant in like Esperanto, you'd, uh, that's what you would say. But this kid just natively extended the use of mal and just applied it to graveda, mal graveda, unpregnant. Makes sense. And it's actually a lot more simplistic than what else you would normally say in Esperanto. Um, another one a kid used was um, seji, to chair. And he used that in the way of meaning to sit because a chair is only ever used really for sitting. So he just applied that logic and went um, seji, you know, seji sur la kusenon, to um, chair on the, um, the cushion, uh, to sit on the cushion. It made sense to him when you think about it. Yeah, it makes sense. It's pretty clear. Now this one I actually read somewhere else. This was someone 
someone else speaking about a native speaker and the word that he used for umbrella, he used for the pluvilo, which means away rain tool. That is so cool and it makes sense because that's what an umbrella is. Umbrella is for the pluvilo. It's something that makes rain go away. That's pretty clever. It's pretty clever. I'm sure unless you're going to talk about like some scientific discovery where, you know, they fly planes into the clouds and get rid of rain clouds or whatever, but it makes sense for the pluvilo in like 99% of cases. But yeah, I thought that was pretty cool, especially how native kids are actually making the language more logical. And if you think about it, in a few generations when you have tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of native speakers, because it's gonna happen. It's definitely gonna happen. I've heard, I've spoken with so many people of learning Esperanto and they're like, yeah, sure, I'll teach this to my kid. And if you think about that, eventually there's gonna be a lot of native speakers. Like when I have a kid, I plan to teach them Esperanto. One, because I want to give them as much, um, like as many chances in life as possible. Like my missus, she's going to teach Chinese. I'm going to teach Esperanto and obviously we're going to speak English together. And I think like Esperanto will be great for, especially for the Latin components and stuff like that. And also for later on in life, like it's got three main language groups there. Like how cool is that? But anyway, there's going to be a lot of native speakers and eventually they're going to make the language more logical as time goes on. Um, so I thought that was pretty fascinating. I don't know about you guys, but but if you've liked this video, give it a like, share it around with your friends, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next video. And if you're not there, well, I'll find you, and I will Seji Sudavin. <laughs>